In this chapter, we conclude our introduction and would like to present few relevant and exciting examples showing the general rules and their application in practice. Microbiome research resulted in some major breakthroughs already, enhancing our understanding in diseases and the importance of the microbiome for planetary health. So let's start with Robert Koch's concept of pathogenicity, which was a milestone in microbiology. The concept explains the origin of human and animal diseases as a consequence of microbial infection and development. These findings shifted the focus of the research community and the public on the role of microorganisms as disease-forming agents that needed to be eliminated. However, comprehensive research over the past century has shown that only a small proportion of microorganisms are associated with disease or pathogenicity. The overwhelming majority of microbes are essential for ecosystem functioning and known for beneficial interactions with other microbes as well as macroorganisms. At the end of the 19th century, the newly established science of environmental microbiology resulted in another paradigm shift. Microorganisms are everywhere in natural environments, often associated with hosts and, for the first time, beneficial effects on hosts were reported. Moreover, Koch, back then, postulated that one specific pathogen is responsible for the disease. The division of microorganisms into beneficial, pathogenic and neutral according to the microbial interaction with their host is based on an anthropocentric view. Indeed, the physiology of the host and the whole microbiome substantially influence the outcome of the interaction. The interactive patterns within these webs may be positive, negative or neutral, where there is no or no observed effect on the functional capacities or fitness of interacting species. Microbial interactions are the basis for functioning and evolutionary dynamics of microbial communities. Host-microbe interactions shape the reciprocal fitness, phenotype and metabolism, giving rise to the theory of co-evolution of microbiota and their host, collectively called the holobiont. The diseased state of the holobiont is characterized by this biosis, the pathobiome. While eubiosis refers to balanced host microbe interaction, which is the healthy microbiome. This biosis describes the altered composition of microbes, which has a cascading impact on the immune system and offers an advantage for emergence and outbreaks of pathogens. This biosis can be also a result of reduced microbial diversity. Within this context of dysbiosis, the pathobiome concept, which represents the the pathogenic agent integrated within its biotic environment was established and applied to multiple pathosystems. This approach suggests that microbial diversity is a key factor in preventing diseases in plants as well as in the human gut. Speaking of the human gut, there is a clear connection between our gut microbiome, our diet and chronic diseases such as obesity. The so-called Western diet, meaning high fat, high sugar, in the opposite of low sugar, high polysaccharide, the so-called CHO diet, leads to severe changes in the gut microbial ecology. So first of all, there is a dramatic decrease in diversity. Then the bacterial phylum bacteroidetes are reduced in numbers and the firmicutes increase, especially the class molecules. The changes in the microbiome include also alterations of the metabolic potential, of course. The import and fermentation of simple sugars is increased, genes encoding for beta-fructosidases enriched, and the depletion for motility genes is detectable. And as a consequence of these diet-induced changes, there is an increased capacity to import Western diet typical carbohydrates and a decreased capacity to metabolize important sugars to short-chain fatty acids. So in the end, the dysbiosis of the gut microbiome increases the risk of getting obese. However, not only diet is influencing our microbiome, the development of the microbiome already starts way earlier, at birth. All of us got our early life microbiome by vertical transmission from our mothers. Through live birth, mammals have important opportunities for mother-to-child microbial transmission through direct surface contact. 
However, many modern practices can reduce microorganisms and gene flow. Caesarean section instead of passage through the birth canal, bottle feeding instead of breastfeeding, early life antibiotics and so on. All these factors are influencing our microbiome. For example, vaginally delivered infants acquired bacterial communities resembling their own mother's vaginal microbiota. And C-section infants harbored bacterial communities similar to those found on the skin surface. So, but what does that mean now? Differences in the delivery mode have been linked to differences in the intestinal microbiota of babies. Mutualistic relationships with intestinal bacteria are known to influence energy balance, pathogen colonization resistance and the maturation of the intestine and the immune system. Similarly important roles are likely played by the microbiotas of non-gut body habitats. Delivery mode may lead to differences in the microbiota's development, which may then contribute to variations in normal physiology or to disease predisposition. So apart from these two examples, diet and birth, many other factors such as lifestyle in general, including stress for example, medical practices, antibiotics and hygiene, and of course also our genetic preposition, affects our microbiome and thus our health. Examples for microbiome dysbiosis related diseases are autism, depression, allergies and even cancer. So what can we do about it? Evidence is accumulating that exercise, a high fiber diet, especially a highly diverse plant-based diet, less meat and more fermented food are beneficial for our microbial inhabitants. But you will hear more about the human microbiome later in another chapter of this online course where we even prepared a game for you. By the way, all factors influencing the microbiome, but also the genomes are currently under observations and the measurement of it is called the exposome. The exposome is defined as the cumulative measure of environmental influences and associated biological responses throughout the lifespan, including exposure from the environment, diet, behavior and endogenous processes. But you will learn more about the exposome later as well. So to sum up the introductory chapter, I want to show you the goals of applied microbiome vision. The grand vision of applied microbiome research is to improve health of humans, animals, plants and the whole ecosystem. In general, microbiomes can be managed either directly by applying microbiome transplants, microbes with beneficial properties or microbiota active metabolites or indirectly by changing environmental conditions in a way that microbiomes also shift their structure and function from dysbiosis into a healthy state. Thank you for your attention.